this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are previewing the Kentucky Derby coming up at Churchill Downs on Saturday by talking to Megan Devine of TVG and getting her favorite bets for this year's Derby. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, we have the draft starting Thursday. Thursday, continuing into Friday, uh, more drafts Saturday, Kentucky Derby Saturday too. It is a brilliant week for sports. How you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm really excited about the NFL draft, uh, all the drama that goes with it, and uh, looking forward to seeing how the bets work out. Especially, um, you know, I mean, I'm interested to see who goes number three, but right. I didn't bet that. And then uh, looking forward to see what what else happens. Yeah, I, I've tried so hard to figure out what's happening at number three. And I think it was like this morning I gave up. Like I was thinking about maybe I go Trey Lance for covering the future as my, you know, favorite bet for this week, looked into it more. And I was like, I have no idea. It was good money. It was plus three seventy at the time, but like, I don't have a good enough read to put like actual hard earned dollars down on this one right now where things currently stand. So I was like, whatever, I'm going to wait a day, let it play out, see what happens. Cause I just have no idea. But that also means there's like this huge ripple effect where what happens at three dictates a lot of what happens elsewhere. So it's kind of a pickle to say the least. Yeah, for sure. And some of the methods I'll talk about later, uh, aggregating uh, some mock drafts from experts, they seem to be dragging a little bit in terms of the quarterbacks. I mean, I'm, I'm actually still, as we're talking on Wednesday afternoon, I'm still waiting for a couple of these mocks to come in. And, you know, like it seems like it's behind the news cycle and the entire yeah. news cycle is on these quarterbacks. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking elsewhere for value there. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, and it's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. If you are looking for some betting coverage of the draft during the draft, we'll be live on air Thursday and Friday on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter pages. It'll be myself, JJ Zacharyson, Brandon Gadula, and our new hire, Ryan Williams, making his FanDuel and Number Fire debut. We'll be live Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern. I'll be focusing on the betting stuff. I have my win total projections all cooked up. Uh, going to be talking about those, some offensive line rankings as well. Brandon will have his win total projections. We'll go head to head a little bit and see how our models are comparing there. Ryan's talking DFS and season long, and of course, JJ updating his projections for rookies live on air. So a lot of good stuff, a lot of reason to make sure you tune in Thursday. That is 8 p.m. Eastern. Then also back on Friday for rounds two and three. That'll be on the same places. FanDuel, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter. And Ed, you've gotten into betting the NFL draft. Have you decided if you're going to bet the Derby this year as well? Uh, there's, there hasn't been too much extra time this week, so probably not. We'll see what Megan Devine says, so I might just uh, tail some of her, uh, her, uh, her opinions. And if you didn't listen last year, I think it would have been September, we had Megan on to preview last year's Kentucky Derby. Obviously, different schedule last year with uh, COVID pushing the Derby back, and she did really well. Uh, she was in on the person who, or the the horse, that person, <laughs> the horse that wound up winning. So we're gonna talk to Megan, get her thoughts on this year's field. Make sure you follow her on Twitter at Megan Divine TV. He, she is a horse rating racing analyst at TVG, also working for NBC at Churchill Downs this week. Uh, she is a host of the Horse Ra- Racing Happy Hour podcast. So a lot of places you can find Megan. We'll have a link to the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast in the show notes up on numberfire.com to get you set for Saturday's Kentucky Derby. If you're looking for some NFL draft thoughts, we already have those posted, uh, one with Matthew Friedman and one with Dr. Eric Eager. Getting their thoughts on the draft, you can find both of those by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, you name it, we're there. And if you like what you hear, make sure you leave a rating and review as well. We'll get to Megan in just a bit to break down this year's Kentucky Derby. But first, got to go back to last week and talk some Talladega because I did have some NASCAR in covering the future last week. Covering the past. So last week's bet for me on covering the, the future was in NASCAR talking Talladega and Worked out pretty much exactly as planned. I had Kaz Grala at plus 550 to finish top 10 in Talladega. He was priced near a bunch of cars with just terrible, non-competitive equipment, but 
His team has more speed than that. Talked about college racing, potentially moving to the Cup Series. They did confirm just today that they will be going full-time in the Cup Series next year. A team that has funding, has speed, and they showed that on Sunday. Grala did exactly what I was hoping he would do. He hung in the back early, staying out of trouble, and that ensured he'd be around to make a late search. And as he's shown in the past in lower series, he has a talent to make a run at a place like Talladega, and he did exactly that. Scooted through the field, the final lap, wound up finishing sixth. So we do cash here a plus 550. I talked before about not loving non-outrights on super speedways because of the high variance there. But I just thought the number here was super far off. So I was very willing to make exceptions. Take the plus uh, 550 for top 10. I thought Grala was the best bet on the board this week. And it worked out to perfection. So Kaz Grala coming through for the cover of the spread of listeners this past week. We're going to talk to Megan Devine here in just one second. But first, Derby Saturday is almost here. If you're new to horse racing or have never bet with TVG before, now is a perfect time to give it a shot because you can bet the Kentucky Derby risk-free. That is right. You'll get up to $20 or $200 back if your horse doesn't win the Derby. If you already have a TVG account, you can get back up to $10 if your horse finishes in second or third place. It's all part of the Money Back Special, and it's available on select races this Saturday at Churchill Downs. TVG gives you all the tools to tackle the Derby. Just sign up with the promo code COVER. That is promo code COVER if you want to bet the Kentucky Derby risk-free exclusively on TVG.com and the TVG app. Go to TVG.com slash cover for details and edit. We can get you into horse racing by using our own promo code to bet the Derby this Saturday. How about that? Yeah, that sounds good, but it has to be a new account, though, doesn't it? For the 201, but if you have a TVG account already, you can get 10 bucks back if they finish second or third. So some wiggle room there for All you. Right. At least that helps Sounds quite good. a bit. So we'll figure out how to how Ed wants to bet this by talking to Megan Devine right now. You can find her on Twitter at Megan Devine TV. Check her out on TVG and NBC. And also on the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast. Let's get her thoughts to get set for Saturday at Churchill Downs. Covering the present. Let's head now to Churchill Downs to talk to Megan Devine about this year's Kentucky Derby. Megan, we had you live from Churchill Downs last year. We are back there once again. What's it like for you to be back out at the the, the stomping grounds for the second time in just like a couple of months now, it feels like? Yeah, thanks, guys. Good to be back with you on the podcast as well. And uh, yeah, I I have nobody's ever been to a derby within like six yeah. months of each other. <laughs> so, you know, it's um, or I guess eight months, but it, it's it's nice to be back. It's it's nice that we can have racing here and, you know, a good amount of fans, too. They're obviously limited on their attendance, but it it's derby such a special time in the horse racing industry in sports in general and of course here to the city of louisville so it kind of lacked that uh, did lack that buzz last year you know the city just kind of comes to life and and everything is electric every there's so much anticipation and excitement and so you kind of feel a little bit of that um now which is, is nice and as we get back to normal with everything it's it's just a good kind of homecoming feeling i guess in a lot of ways Right. Is it is it back to like regular levels or still kind of like a 70 percent type thing where it's not quite the same buzz, but getting closer to normal? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, attendance, I believe, is limited at 20 percent at the okay. racetrack. So there is, you know, a small number of people here compared to what we're used to. But I think we're all just so desperate for normalcy that any little bit of buzz feels so uh, it's very, <laughs> you know, heartwarming. <laughs> Absolutely. And is, has it been that way for the entire lead up to the Derby, too? Because like there are other races, obviously, getting mm-hmm. set for the Derby. Has it been similar to where it's been, you know, a little bit odd, but, you know, at least better than last year in that sense? Um, it definitely feels better to have people here for sure. Like you mentioned, there are a lot of other races that go on leading up to the Kentucky Derby. We have racing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and, uh, obviously Friday and Saturday are the big days. So it is, uh, all racing all the time over here. So we're all very busy, but, um, it's nice to hear the fans cheering on the horses as they come down the stretch. And, uh, as you probably just heard, cause they just ran a race. I am currently at Churchill Downs. Um, so <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's nice to have that, that feeling back and to hear the people get excited about racing because, uh, um, we do love a sport and we love the animals, so it's it's a good feeling. And as a video person, you get Nat sound back, which is yeah, what more yeah, could exactly. we ask for? Right, I know. <laughs> I don't have to cue it or anything. It's just happening. <laughs> exactly. This is perfect. Well, Megan, when we talked to you last year, it was kind of odd because we were talking to you in September. Obviously, it was very different. That altered the prep work and the research you do to try to diagnose what will happen. Mm-hmm. Is this year different now with the more normal schedule versus what we talked with you heading into last year from like an overall like process perspective? 
Yeah, I mean, the main thing about last year, which uh, the eventual winner, Authentic, you know, he was a horse. They're all individuals. They're not robots. They're not. They are living, breathing animals, and we try very hard to make them happy. And, you know, it's like a 26-hour-a-day job. Um, But, you know, he was a horse, a colt that was very mentally immature. Had the Derby been in May last year for him, he likely would not have won. He was very talented, um, and he showed that in a lot of his prep races that were early on in the year. But he just, I don't think, would have been able to handle, especially if there was, you know, 100,000 people like a normal Derby. He wouldn't have been able to handle all of those elements, I think. So um, the fact that it was so late in the year, he was able to develop mentally, develop physically. He's a bigger horse. He was a bigger, stronger version of, of the horse he would have been in the springtime. So, you know, getting back to the normal derby time, it's definitely the age of the horses that come into play. You know, the mentality that they have, if you have a horse that's a little bit more of a late bloomer, you're really going to struggle in a big spot like this. So it gets back to the normal handicapping, I guess, that we usually do um, for for the Kentucky Derby. And there's so many of those elements that go into it. Now, this year, of course, there were still some cancellations due to COVID, due to weather um, in Arkansas, where a lot of these horses have their prep races. The Southwest Stakes, which is a Kentucky Derby prep race is was pushed back weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks so you know there was that aspect of it too in that they they weren't able to stick on the same schedule um as they would have liked to which which may have you know made things complicated for a few horses keep me in mind being one of those excellent so there were a bunch of uh kentucky derby prep races from february through april and a lot of horses in this field race there how much weight do you put on those results when you're trying to figure out who's going to win at Churchill Downs? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you certainly want to look at um, how those horses have performed in the prep races because those are or should be right. The, the upper echelon um, of sorts, but not every Kentucky Derby prep race is created equally. There are certainly different variations of fields. You know, you might have some races that are, are harder than others as far as the, the talent level goes. On my podcast, The Horse Racing Happy Hour, which we do weekly, we kind of have our own grading system, as we call it. So big races in the U.S. are considered graded stakes. You have grade one, which is the top, grade two, just below that, then grade three, and then a listed stakes race. And that is decided by a committee. There's a graded stakes committee that, um, you know, every year, every couple of years decides which races are grade one, grade two, et cetera. Um, And so they kind of stay like that for a while, but they may not always live up to that title. And so something that we try to do throughout the year is to say, okay, well, this was technically a grade one, but how did it really measure up as far as the talents of that field? And so if you kind of can follow along with some of these horses and figure out, okay, this horse finished second, what did it do after that in that race? How tough was that competition? It kind of gives you a lot more of an understanding of the credentials and the potential talent of the eventual winner or the contenders of that particular Kentucky Derby prep race. So one thing I try to do with like NASCAR betting is try to identify like similar races and look Mm -hmm. at those and put more weight on those. Uh If you were to identify prep races that you determined to be most relevant for, obviously it's not the same field, but like if you were looking for the most relevant ones people should look at, which ones stand out to you as being the best parallels for Saturday? I mean, historically, the Florida Derby and, uh, and the races in California as well, the Santa Anita Derby, have produced the most Kentucky Derby winners, at least of, of late. Um, an Arkansas Derby winner would have been American Pharaoh, of course, um, but there really haven't been, there have been a lot of very talented horses that have come through that path, but there haven't been a lot of Kentucky Derby winners. So, um, you know, I would say probably the Florida Derby and, uh, and the Santa Anita races. But this year, in particular, You know, Known Agenda is the horse that won the Florida Derby, and he's for Todd Pletcher. He certainly looks to be a contender, but I don't know that he's at the top of my list because I didn't feel like the the Florida Derby was as salty as I would have liked it to be in 2021. And then in California as well, Rock Your World, who won the uh, Santa Anita Derby, is a horse that originally started his career on turf and then switched over to the dirt, which is not something that we often see with a lot of these classic distance um, dirt type of horses. So you know, we'll see if that race ended up being, like I said, of grade one caliber as well. Okay. This is the perfect context to get. I love that you're giving this. Thank you so much. That's perfect. (laughs) Now, another important component you talked about last year, specifically Mm -hmm. with the winner, was the post positions. And you thought that, you know, the the post could play a large role in how you want to diagnose things. Right. Those were released on Tuesday for this year's Derby. Yeah. What impact did those have on betting for you? And did, did the draw there alter anything for your view of any of the horses here? Uh huh. It definitely has a big impact. I mean, it depends on your type of horse. If you are a horse that 
uh, that is able to, um, you know, kind of sit back and, and uh, save some ground. You might not necessarily need to have a, a position where you have to go up there early. Now, it is different, too, because they, they're using a different starting gate this year than they have in years past. Um, previously, there were two gates that they use, uh, the main gate and then an auxiliary gate that was a little shorter. And there were two things here that are important to note. One, there was a little bit of a gap um, between those two. And then the horse that was in the one position, if you looked out that starting stall, you would run into the rail. Like you oh. had to get out there, go to the side and then go forward. So, I mean, you had no choice but to really go forward because if you didn't, now you've got a wall of 19 horses that are gonna come over and totally screw things up for you. So, you know, you had to, to definitely think about what your horse's pace was, preferred pace was, and then you had to say, okay, where can we go from here? So now they're using a new starting gate that it's set up a little bit differently. It's all one solid gate. So you may not have that same issue as far as the one hole is concerned or the auxiliary gate, but there's also some differences with that too, with the way it closes, with the size of the stalls are a little bit smaller. They got it from Europe where they do things differently. So there's a lot of question marks going into this year. <laughs> So you've been at Churchill Downs this week. Uh, you are there last week as well. Uh, have you been able to pick up anything from uh, just catching these personality of these horses? And then also, how would you like? How would you weight like these types of observations versus uh, the race results we talked about earlier? Um, it's definitely something that um, that I place a lot of credence on. I mean, I being a horse person myself, I've ridden horses for over 20 years and um, all types of different horses, show horses for the most part, but I did gallop race horses for a little while. Um, and, you know, you want to make sure that the horse that you are interested in is handling things well, that they are kind of taking everything in stride. They're very professional. They're very workmanlike as they go about um, their training leading up into the race and schooling in the paddock and how do they deal with the crowd and how are they during the morning works? Uh, how are they with the weather if it's really hot or cold? Um, so there's a lot of those kind of things that are hard to quantify per se um, that I think go into to deciding if this horse is going to be able to perform when it comes down to, to game time. Like I said, they're, they are individuals, you know. You mentioned NASCAR. I guess it would be kind of the same thing as like, a, say, a driver that gets nervous or something. Right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Or isn't able to handle the pressure or the heat or whatever. It's kind of the same thing, you know. So it's very... Um, you have to, to take all of those in stride. And I, I tend to, I like to watch the, the workouts of the horses. I like to watch them school. Midnight Bourbon has gotten loose on the backside. He got away from his handler the other day. Uh, and he was acting up in the paddock as well. So he was a little bit of a bad actor. We're hoping he kind of relaxes as we look towards the race. And um, I don't think there's anybody else that's been too terribly keen in any way, but you definitely notice the ones that are, that are professionals. Okay, midnight, so midnight Bourbon is maybe the best yeah, name of a horse or human. There's, yeah, before. and you have Midnight Bourbon and you have um, Bourbonic as well. So if you're looking for a Bourbon Exacta, that's your drink. That's your play. <laughs> <laughs> this is my kind of bet. I like this. This is perfect. Yeah. So let's talk about some more individual horses here because essential quality is a favorite. There are two mm -hmm. to one. And then there's a decent gap back to Rocky or Roll, who you mentioned uh, has right. done well in the prep races. Uh -huh. Let's talk about essential quality first. Do you okay. think that they are deserving of those super short odds at two to one? I mean, this is a horse that's undefeated. So yes, I mean, he's <laughs> done anything wrong. You know, he has he has passed every test that um, that he has been given with absolute flying colors. And you know, the the one thing I guess that people are saying, and this goes back to our earlier conversation, is that okay, he won the Bluegrass Stakes coming into this race, but how how tough was that field really? Highly motivated was a tough horse. He's also in the Derby, and they went head to head down the lane. But it was pretty much those two horses, and then everybody else. So, you know, was that race good enough? Were the numbers he ran in that race good enough to say he should win with ease, you know, as the favoritism implies? Um, but still, he is undefeated. Nine horses have exited the Kentucky Derby undefeated. He's hoping to add himself to that list. Um, he's got to turn back around here in about three or four weeks, which is normal for a horse. But one must wonder as well, you know, how tough was it that he really dueled with highly motivated? How much did that take out of him to now turn around and you know, run another marathon, so to say, if you had just done that a couple of weeks before, are you going to really be at the top of your game even higher, you know, in that amount of time? So I think he's he's certainly um, deserving of being the favorite. He's handled everything very professionally this week and to see him up close and personal. The trainer Brad Cox is really excited about him. He's schooled great. So um, he he's definitely a horse that I'm looking at at the top spot. But, uh, 
you know, you, you certainly, if you're looking to make some money, especially with your wagers, depending on what kind of a bet you want to do, if you want to play any exactas, if you want to key a horse, trifecta, et cetera, super effective, some people like, um, you know, maybe you, you single in your uh, pick threes, pick fours, whatever. There are some other horses that you might want to look at. And, and I'm going to try to take a shot with a few long shots, including Keep Me in Mind, Midnight Bourbon being one of those who I thought has worked really well and had some good excuses. And then um, Mandaloon as well, the other Brad Cox horse in there is is one that I am interested in. I, I talked to Brad Cox this morning about his last race where he just ran an absolute clunker. And he he said, I, I couldn't figure it out. There's just there's no rhyme or reason for how bad that horse ran that day. It's not him and just kind of if you can excuse it and hope that we're going to see the horse that we had seen previously. Cool. So you talked about a bunch of uh, long shots. Uh, you skipped over all the other horses that are uh, 10 to one or shorter. <laughs> so let's yeah. talk about them. There's rock your world at five to one known agenda, mm -hmm. six to one hot rod, Charlie, man, awesome names this year. Eight <laughs> to one. Yeah. Highly motivated, uh, 10 to one. So, um, I mean, clearly you didn't mention these as your value picks, yeah. but, uh, any insights on these four guys? I mean, highly, highly motivated is a horse that, like I said, he went head to head with essential quality. So in a case, in a sense, if you like essential quality, you kind of have to like highly motivated, right? Um, the other thing about it is these horses are still young. They're three years old. Horses live into their, into their 20s. So these are like, you know, teenagers, if you will. Um, and so we're expecting a lot of them at a very young age. And there's still a lot of development that's going on. So a horse like Highly Motivated, he's trained by Chad Brown, who's never won a Kentucky Derby, but he has won multiple training titles as far as our like year-end awards go. He's had many, many good horses, Breeders' Cup winners. You mentioned it. He's always a top trainer. Um, and his horse, Highly Motivated, the time that he ran in the Bluegrass Stakes was actually only the first time, I believe, first or second time that the horse had gone a route of ground, meaning a longer distance. So he started off sprinting and then they stretched out the distance with him and saw, and saw how he could handle that. And now he's going to run the longest distance of his career and possibly he will ever run with a mile and a quarter. For all of these horses, they've never run a mile and a quarter before. This is the first time. So it's also a litmus test as far as the stamina goes for these horses. And, you know, you have to kind of take the performance that Highly Motivated put in in the bluegrass and say, OK, is that the best that's going to get for him? Or is that just a stepping stone for him to improve off of that? The first time is always a question mark. So I kind of took it as Chad Brown knows how to develop his horses. This horse decided, you know, they, they pushed him to go long. And I think he can probably go even further based off of what he's shown and also based off of uh, bloodlines and breeding, which is a huge thing in our industry. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go back to the long shots you've mentioned there, because I thought that there were some interesting ones there. Keep me in mind is 50 to mm -hmm. one midnight bourbon, 20 to one. Who is your favorite of the long shot of the long there? shots? <laughs> yeah. And, and what puts you on that specific horse? Yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely think that, uh, that keep me in mind is an exciting horse because he, uh, horses when they win their first race, we call it, they breaking their maiden. So he, Typically, you have races that are specifically for maiden horses, right? Maiden special weight or a maiden claiming race. You win that race, then you get to go to the next level. So it's either a claiming race, allowance race, stakes race, whatever. Um, and so he actually was a horse that they had enough confidence in him that he still he, he ran a race or two and he didn't win. So he didn't break his maiden. They're like, you know what? Screw it. We're going to enter him in a grade two, which is the second highest level that we have in our industry here at Churchill Downs at the end of last year. And he won that race. So he actually broke his maiden in a graded stakes race, which is, I mean, a hard thing to do. Not a lot of horses can do that. So one, he showed that he had a lot of talent, the talent that they, the connections believed he had and had not yet shown. Uh, and two is that he already likes this track, which Churchill Downs can be kind of a tough track for some horses. You either like it or you don't. And that's the case at a lot of different tracks. So the fact that he's shown some affinity over this surface, I think is really um, a good thing to note. He worked very, very well last time. Um, so his final preparation for the Kentucky Derby, I thought was visually very impressive. He's got such a massive stride. He covers a lot of ground. He seemed to be a horse that mentally checked all the boxes for me as well. They're actually making an equipment change with him. So they're taking the blinkers off, which is something important to note because he, you know, may not be able to see his competition or he might be a little too keen doing too much early in the race. And for a horse like him, who's a hard closer, he comes running towards the end. Um, you know, you have to leave something for the end of the race. So the fact that they're taking those blinkers off to keep him a little bit more relaxed, I think, is a positive move. And two works back as well. The exercise rider worked him and he went a little too fast and, and wasn't able to finish up nicely. But this last work, his jockey, David Cohen, actually flew in. To, to Kentucky from Arkansas, where he's uh, finishing out the meet there to work this horse and a couple of others, 
got on a plane, flew back to Arkansas that same morning to be there for the races and then won a stakes race. <laughs> so, I mean, he, he likes this horse. He, he was committed to being here, you know, for the preparation for keep me in mind. And like I said, just the visual impression for me as he was breezing over this track the other morning, I thought, man, that's a, a serious horse. And for a long shot, I mean, I'll take it if it's at, you know, right. comes in third, fourth, you want to include in your superfecta, whatever, cross the board bet. Who doesn't love those for the Kentucky Derby? So I'm trying to look for some of those bigger prices. That is the information that has gotten Megan Devine like 16 different jobs in the horse racing industry, <laughs> including know. over at uh, your own company. I need to stop the information on time for it. <laughs> no, this is great. This is fantastic. Like that's the context we want. That's the context we signed up for. Uh -huh. We appreciate it. Uh, Absolutely. So that's why vid horse is so valuable and all that stuff. So Megan, mm -hmm. that was fantastic. Thank you so much for swinging by for today and breaking down the Kentucky Derby, but also just like have fun this week. Enjoy having fans there again. Enjoy being at the track and enjoy watching some racing. We appreciate you taking some time to talk to us during that time. Yeah, guys, thanks so much. I hope you enjoy it as well. Hopefully uh, we gave you some good insight and you'll have to tell me if you hit a winner there as, uh, as Saturday comes along. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have All fun. Right. Appreciate it. Bye. Covering the future. One final big thank you to Megan Devine for swinging by and breaking down this week's Kentucky Derby. Again, make sure you follow Megan on Twitter at Megan Devine TV. Check her out on the Horse Racing Happy Hour. The link to that is up on the Number Fire show notes. And also uh, check out her work over at TVG and NBC. Let's move now into covering the future for this weekend. And we want to talk more draft. You've got a draft prop you like. I've got one I like to close up shop here for our final bets for the NFL draft. And you look at the board right now. Where are you see seeing some lingering value? Yeah, so I talked a little bit uh, last week about how kind of so er everything I'm doing is is based on what is wisdom of crowds and, and Benjamin Robinson has put this grinding the mocks uh, tool together and it simply aggregates mock drafts um, from a wide variety of sources and that tool turns out to be kind of better for later first round picks um, but it turns out that experts are are better for earlier picks top ten ish type picks um so what i've done is I've, I've taken some of the experts um they're they're all included in benjamin's thing but uh i've been able to kind of go to a couple sources and look how these people have done over the last uh three years and put together 14 people that that i think um have some insight and a variety of insights too so uh so that'll give me a more of a sense of what i think is going to happen in the top 10 and uh the one player that really stood out was patrick Sertan the cornerback from Alabama. He's considered uh, a high floor prospect. Um, should be the first cornerback off the board. Uh, but, you know, there's a couple There's a couple other cornerbacks that, that are... Uh, Caleb Failure is one that's considered kind of more a potentially high ceiling type guy. Of course, I think he just had back surgery recently, which has uh, kind of tanked his drafts slot. But, so when you look at these 14 uh, expert mock drafts that I've kind of put together, 11, 11 of them have Sertan going to Dallas at the 10th pick. So that's kind of the, the wisdom of crowds consensus there. Uh, one of them has them going before. I think uh, eight, the eight and the nine spot are also potential landing spots for him. Two mock drafts do have Sertan going after the 10th pick, uh, but these are two of the earlier ones in my data set. And in fact, at least one of them, I'm waiting on an update uh, from that person. So, you know, that does suggest a lot of value in uh, Sertan going under 10 and a half. Um, there's a, so I like that. It's one minus 159 at DraftKings right now. Uh, the price is worse at FanDuel, <laughs> which often seems to be the case. So, John Sheeran, just got to uh, be less sharp. Help us out, man. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I thought that was interesting. You know, the wisdom of crowd certainly thinks that, you know, it's unlikely that he falls below Dallas. Uh, Dallas certainly could use some more help in the secondary, uh, which was not good last year. So, um, yes, Patrick Sertan under 10 and a half. And I think everything that I've heard about the Dallas pick specifically is that if he's there, he's gone. Like, they're taking him. Well, I like, mean, that, without a second thought. And, like, the mocks reflect that based on what you're seeing. It. And it goes back to what we talked about with Matthew Friedman, where sometimes these more certain things are not juiced up enough to where they should be. And 159 seems like it's not enough based on the experts, what they're saying, based on also just like logic for the Cowboys, given how good that offense could be if their offensive line is healthy next year. 
why wouldn't they go defense? Especially as someone, like you said, who, who's perceived to be as high of a floor of a guy as Sertan is. So I think that makes a lot of sense. And based on, you know, just reading what everyone has said, it does seem like Sertan, a certain thing to go in the top 10. So I like that as well. And as I said, make sure you shop around because uh, you can uh, make sure you're getting the best number. There are wide ranging numbers on these draft props. Uh, but the Sertan one, is that the one you feel best about among the best, the bets you've made? Uh, I think so. I mean, yeah. Najee Harris has kind of moved from 30 and a half to 25 and a half, <laughs> you know, at DraftKings when I bet, I talked about that last week. So yeah. probably no more value there. Um, you know, there's a couple other ones, uh, that I like as well, but what I, what I like the most, Jim, is seeing these market price move rapidly everywhere, even the ones yeah. that I'm not betting. And yeah. like we talked about last week, that's a signal that, you know, the bookmakers struggle to put out opening lines, right? Yeah. And it's been interesting, you know, you've seen all these books put out, um, new bets every day this week, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's some head to head ones. Over at FanDuel, uh, that I haven't quite finished my analysis on before we jumped on here, but those those look pretty interesting as well. So, you know, I think that the strategy is like, you know, find a tool, find find a, like a grinding the mocks, um, do some analysis, and and don't think about it too much. Just yeah. just bet it because it's probably moving fast. Well, yeah, we talked about the Jalen Waddle, Devonte Smith one last week with Dr. Eric Eager. I think it was like. Pretty, it wasn't. It wasn't quite even money by that point. Waddle had itched ahead, but now Waddle is minus three ten to go ahead of Devonte Smith at FanDuel. So things do move fast for sure. So if you like something, bet it and hope you get some closing line value there. Now you so, talked so about. So actually, Jim, just let me stop you real quick. Yeah. Uh, so Waddle's only ahead of Devonte Smith and seven of the fourteen experts. So, so actually, maybe there's ran. value on Devonte Smith plus one sixty four. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about it. I mean, that's that's what the the mocks say. I mean, I'm I'm still waiting on two updates a little bit later today, um, <laughs> which is also the fun of this, right? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, you know, places publishing their last mock drafts. Uh, you yeah. know, you, you know, even someone that um, uh, Matthew Friedman talked about. Um, so, so Jeremiah yeah. or. Yeah, I, I I last I checked, which was a couple hours ago, his last yeah. mock was not yet up, I and was he had tweeted about submitting it. I was looking for him earlier too. So we are, uh, <laughs> we're tilting the same thing here. We're Googling the exactly. same things. So I can guarantee you that. Exactly. Uh, so I by the time talk... this is published, yeah. it should certainly be up. You would hope. You would hope. Uh, but Daniel Jeremiah, a busy guy. So <laughs> understandable for sure. Now you talked about Najee Harris. And I, my bet is related to Najee Harris. And because I want to talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think they are going to take an offensive lineman in the first round, which is plus 165 at FanDuel Sportsbook. All the smoke thus far has been around a running back, and that could happen. Like, Kevin Colbert, their GM, said literally, he's good taking a running back in the first round. He said it flat out. They said if they can get a playmaker, a contributor, they don't care what position they are. He said that. I acknowledge that they could go running back. I just don't know whether the talk is a smoke screen or not. And to be clear, they're going to go running back early, whether it's the, the first round, second round, etc. I just don't... Based on the data I'm looking at, I don't think it'll be with the first pick, especially because their offensive line is so bad. I've cooked up some very rudimentary offensive line rankings to use for our live stream Thursday night. It's based on player production, the value of each position, and stuff like that. And when I run those rudimentary rankings, the Steelers rank 29th in the league in the offensive line rankings. They have lost their left tackle, their left guard, and their center to free agency this year. They've got some guys they can move around and try to patch those holes internally, but it looks like a pretty much a dumpster fire out there. That's also a good spot to pick an offensive lineman uh, based on where things stack up in the draft right now. If you go to The Athletic and check out Arif Hassan's consensus big board, the they have linemen ranked 15th, 16th, and 21st. The Steelers ranked 24th, or they picked 24th. Those could all be gone, those guys in that range, in which case the value of this bet goes down, but... There are some linemen in the 30s who may be undervalued by the consensus big board. Uh, Kevin Colbert has been their GM since 2000. So we actually have a lot of good data on his draft tendencies. And I know the Steelers sometimes can be laughed at for certain things, specifically the Ben Roethlisberger stuff last year, the way things collapse. But they seem to value high value positions at high picks in the NFL draft. In the past five drafts, they've had 16 picks in the top three rounds. Five have been quarterbacks or wide receivers. Four have been cornerbacks. 
only one offensive lineman, but they've had such a good offensive line there. They haven't really needed to, do, to address that position. That's no longer the case. I do believe they will go running back at some point very early, especially if they can get uh, one of the top three guys. But at plus 165, I think there's value in betting them to take an offensive lineman with their first pick. Now, Adam, guessing the expert mocks are not going to like this one because I have seen every mock seems to have them taking a running back. However, when you pair that with Najee Harris's total still being over 24, I feel like it's not a lock they go running back yet. So what did the what does your database say about the Steelers pick at 24? Well, our guy Evan Silva has the Steelers taking Landon Dickerson, uh, the Alabama Love offensive it. lineman. So who can do cartwheels like three weeks or three months after getting ACL surgery? Love it. He's great. <laughs> so Evan, Evan's on your side. Uh, the rest of them, uh, not so much, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. Is it mostly split between just offensive linemen and running backs? I mean, there's a lot of running backs. I mean, there's a new one uh, with Javante Williams there, which was someone that Dr. Eric Eager mentioned yep. last week. Um, there's a Caleb Farley in there, the cornerback that we discussed earlier. So yeah, there's a, there's a variety. There's an edge rusher there in here as well. I think the good thing is if you feel strongly that they go running back, which again, I, I don't, uh, that's also plus 130. Like it is plus money as well, FanDuel Sportsbook. I don't think it's a guarantee they take one or the other. Otherwise, I just said just bet the max on both and lock in a profit. But I don't think that's a certainty. I think the best value here and the best way to attack this is going offensive line plus 165. Just the way things shape up with their offensive line, it's a really hideous unit right now. I think... I have, a, I have some respect for their front office with the way they've handled things in the past. And as a result of that, I have faith they will do the right thing and take an offensive lineman in the first round. But we'll see how things play out on Thursday. As mentioned, we're back here again uh, talking NFL draft on Thursday, 8 p.m. on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter pages. We'll be talking about these draft props throughout the night, also DFS and season-long stuff. So make sure you are subscribed over there and tune in on Thursday, 8 p.m. and Friday at 7 p.m. to get the betting, DFS, and season-long implications of this year's draft. Ed, uh, you were talking about uh, emailing out stuff from your database out to your subscribers. If people are interested in the findings you've had based on your research, where can they find that data? Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll post it on the I'll, I'll post it on my site on my blog a little bit later. That email, um, the email's already out, so I'll, I'll post it over on the blog uh, by the time this gets out. So you can check out, you know, one through thirty-two, what the experts are saying. Okay, that's over at thepowerrank.com. Anything else for you cooking up this week? So I have an awesome episode of the Football Analytics Show. I talked to Matt Waldman, who's the creator of the Rookie Scouting Portfolio. And this man spends hours, hundreds of hours um, scouting quarterbacks, receivers, and running backs and puts all that information in this Rookie Scouting Portfolio. So uh, it's a great resource. Uh, he was a great interview, gave some awesome stories about how he started uh, this whole project by locking himself in a hotel room for a week. And uh, also some awesome stories about... Uh, the important people in the NFL that that read his his products. So, had Matt, Matt Waldman on the Football Analytics Show. Please check it out. Uh, check out the uh, the mock stuff Ed was talking about over at thepowerrank.com. Also, check out the Football Analytics Show. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Uh, Ed is on Twitter at thepowerrank. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you once again to Megan Devine for swinging by and breaking down this year's Kentucky Derby. Check her out on Twitter at Megan Devine TV. Also, check out her work at TVG, NBC, and the Horse Racing Happy Hour Podcast. Thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you with your Kentucky Derby and NFL draft bets. It's going to be a fun week. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Mm-hmm.